Good morning, church. Will you stand with us as we worship together this morning? Sometimes I wonder, is he faithful? Does he see me in my troubles? Does he understand? Sometimes I question, is he able? Can he rescue? Can he save me again and again? But when I look back, Jesus, we thank you that we can give you praise, that we can lift up your name. You are worthy of praise, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. With you, we stand on the firm foundation. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Why would I worry when giants come calling my name? My God is so much bigger than troubles I face. And why would I hunger for power or riches or fame? My God is so much better than all of these things. So I won't be shaken And I won't be moved My God is faithful His promise is true So I speak to the mountains It's time to move God is big. 
on you, Lord Jesus. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save us. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you.
you are holy Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you, Lord Jesus We live for you We live for you, Lord Jesus We live for you We just say that this morning Oh, we live for you, Lord Jesus We live for you You are worthy of our praise we live for you, Lord Jesus. We live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me.
not forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me I am who you say I am Come on, declare it over your life I am chosen, not forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me You are for me, not against me I am who you say I am I am chosen I am chosen, not forsaken that you loved us so much that you were prepared to send your son Jesus to die on a cross so that we might have victory today. Oh Lord, how can we not but sing praise to your wonderful name, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We thank you that you made room in your house for us and that today we are not guests in your house, but we are family. We are your sons and your daughters. And today here in church, we stand as your family. We belong to you. We have identity. We have purpose. We have hope because we belong to you, Jesus. We love you. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We pray, Lord, that you will just come by your spirit this morning and do a great, great work in our hearts today. We thank you for your presence in the house, Holy Spirit. There is nothing like your presence. We give you glory. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Will you give Jesus praise? He is worthy. Hallelujah. We're going to have a great Sunday. Before you sit down this morning, please turn around, just wave to say good morning. It's so good to see you. Thank you. Over to you, Pastor Lisa. Uh, good morning, New Life Church. Um, it is good to be in the house of God. Chris and I obviously we missed church last week. We were a little bit under the weather. We are improving. We are healed. We are getting stronger in the name of Jesus. But you know, it was such a privilege. And amen. Yes, we all. That is God's promise to each one of us. His healing power and His strength and His mercy is renewed every single morning and His grace is sufficient for us. No matter what we're going through, He promises us His grace. Um, there's a song that says, it's, it's not a really good song, so I wouldn't recommend you listen to the lyrics, but there's a song that says, I get knocked down, but I get up again, and you're never gonna keep me down. And I really think that's what it's like to be a Christian. You know, sometimes the enemy comes, people come, they wanna knock us down, they wanna take away our influence, take away our voice, but you know, God says get up again because He's in the business of getting up all the time. We haven't failed until we don't get up. Getting up is success is success. We don't fail backwards, we fail forwards. And um, just to pray for everybody who has suffered any sickness during this time. I know there has been quite a lot of 
um, um, flus and swine flus and COVIDs and goodness knows what. So we just really trust God for His healing blanket, His healing protection around every single one of you and your families at this time. Well, a very warm welcome to each one of you. Um, you it's sitting here in the auditorium, I was going to actually say last week, it was such a blessing that Chris and I, even though we weren't well, we didn't have to miss out on church. We sat in bed in our pajamas and had a coffee and we watched church online. And so what a blessing to have church online. And so everybody who's watching online, a very warm welcome, a good morning to each, a chilly good morning to each one of you. And uh, we trust that you enjoy the service with us. And um, if you are new, we would encourage you to go through to our Connect, our website, head over to the Connect page and send us some information and we'd love to get in contact with you. And then obviously those that are here in the auditorium, a very warm welcome to each one of you and if you are new you can head over to the webs I mean the welcome desk where there will be someone to help you and you always need to remember something about church we never have load shedding at church the reason we never have load shedding at church is because we have got a very very big generator and so don't ever let load shedding keep you away from church. If you haven't managed to blow dry your hair, don't worry, just stick it in a bun or stick it in a cap or put a scarf on or do something or put a hoodie and just a beanie, whatever. Just come to church. It's important and we can always promise you that the coffee is hot at church. So if you're needing that fix for the morning, not just your Jesus fix, but your coffee fix, please come through <laughs> to New Life Church. Um, a few quick announcements. Um, this coming Sunday is Discover Your Design. Um, it's our growth track part two. It's all about discovering your gifts and your talents and the way that God has made you. And He's made you for a purpose. And so often we look at somebody and think, I'm not like them and I wished I was like them. And the reason you're not like them is because didn't God didn't create you like them. He created you like you, uniquely made. And it's so important as Christians, if we're going to function in the body of Christ, that we're going to fulfill our destiny. We need to know those gifts. We need to know how God has called us to operate and function. And so I really want to encourage you to come along this Sunday. Plus, it'll be joining the team and you'll get to meet a whole lot of our team. And um, it's just a really fun, exciting morning. Um, I'm going to just have to put my glasses on for a sec because I can't remember what the other ones are. Um, whilst I do that, I know it is water baptism. Um, there we go. Get myself sorted out here. All right, water baptism class on Thursday. So it's Thursday the 26th at 7 p.m. online. So it's online and you can register on our app. If you haven't downloaded our app, please download our app. You know, I'm, I'm over 50. So for me, more apps just seem like stress. But I've got onto Planning Center. We've got a new database system and onto our app. And I'm telling you, it's the easiest user-friendly app ever. So if you need help with that, you can go through to the foyer, go to the Welcome Center. Someone will be able to help you. So you can book online or you can I mean, book on the website or on our app. Um, then also we have Into Me, Into Me UC Marriage Conference, which is on... Saturday the 4th of June from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And it's, a, it's 400 rand a couple for this course. And um, it's live lectures. It's with Mads De Diesel. And you know Mads, she's ministered here. She does a lot of the counseling courses here. And it's really, really worth taking that amount of time and that amount of money out of your schedule to invest into your marriage. Marriages are getting hit left, right, and center. And as Christians, we need to be doing all we can to build and strengthen our marriage. You know, there is no perfect marriage, whether you married for one year or 30 years or 50 years. We all need help in the area of our marriage. So come along. Lunch will be served. It's going to be a wonderful opportunity um, to grow in your marriage. And then we've got some barista training. If you liked, who liked what happened last on Mother's Day? Who liked what happened on Mother's Day? Who got a cappuccino on Mother's Day? It was nice, hey. Well, if you wanna see more of that at New Life Church, then we need more baristas. So we've got barista training. Um, it is on Tuesday and Wednesday, and I hope the dates are up there. Tuesday and Wednesday this week. Am I correct? Is it Tuesday, Wednesday this week? Yes, yes, 
Yay, it's right. So you can just go put your name down at the Welcome Center. So proper barista, coffee training, how to make cappuccinos. We need, there are seven slots available. There aren't many. So please go and register for that. And just to remind you, after the service, there is coffee and tea available for each one of you. On New Life, is just a very big thank you for the way that you give and the way you serve and sow into this ministry. At New Life, we would never be able to do what we do without your giving. And especially during these tough, hard two years, it's been a tough two years for, for people. And, um, and we just wanna thank you and honor you for staying faithful to the things of God. And uh, your giving enables us to minister in Bryanston, Alexander, Cosmo City, and Deep Slot. And at the moment, we are able to feed 325 people per month. That's a whole month's food for a person. And you know, it, sound, it is amazing. And it's 350, 25 people that, that are in our churches that would not have if it wasn't for you. And we would like to get that number, obviously increase that number. But New Life is just to bless you as you give. The Bible says more blessed to give than to receive. And it truly is. It truly is more blessed to give than to receive. But you know, with God, we have such a loving God. You know, He's always got, He's got the one up on us all the time. Even though we, it's, we get blessed by giving, He still blesses us even more. And so just thank you, church, for the way you give your tithes and your offering into this house in Jesus' name. Thank you, ushers. You can serve the church and we're gonna watch some TV news and then continue with wisdom. Enjoy. Hey everyone, whether you're with us in person or online, we're so glad you're joining us today. A lot of great things are happening here at New Life. Here are just a few. To stay connected with all that is going on, visit newlifechurch.co.za, follow us on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or sign up for our newsletter. If you'd like to give today, you can give via the offering bag, visit the giving station situated in the foyer, and regardless of where you are, you can always give online at newlifechurch.co.za. We have so many opportunities for all ages to grow, connect, and be encouraged. To learn more, stop by the Welcome Center situated in the foyer or visit newlifechurch.co.za. No matter where we gather, in person or online, here or there, we are New Life Together. Thanks again for joining us today. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Almost preached with my mask on, but maybe it's a, it's a good thing. I have no symptoms, and uh, so my doctor said I'm all good to be here. And uh, thank you for your love and your prayers and uh, grace and healing to everybody else that um, has been undergoing or going through any uh, ailments, uh, illnesses. And uh, may we just be conscious of no matter what valleys we ever go through as God's people, that there's something that we can cling to and that is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, and He loves us and is helping us, and uh, the Bible says, Jesus said, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus has come to give life in its fullness, and uh, so we might have some momentary setbacks and a few afflictions, but it cannot be compared to the beautiful glory uh, that awaits each one of us and that is at work in each one of us, amen? And uh, just worshiping together with you this morning, uh, just so conscious of God's great love and mercy for every one of you, everyone online and everyone here in Bryanston, that you are the flock of God, that Jesus is our great shepherd and he loves the sheep. He loves you and me deeply. And in these days we can be led by the great shepherd. The sheep know his voice. Uh, in fact, it was yesterday or two days ago I received a little YouTube video from one of our members and uh, it was about a dear dad just sharing a story as he and his wife were looking back over the years and seeing the little daughter, some home videos and baby had just been born, daughter just born and uh, he forgot this but as uh, he's looking at his daughter, she's crying. She's only two minutes old 
And uh, there he consoles her and he begins speaking to her and saying, I love you. And as he, she listens to her dad's voice, it's in that moment that she, cr- she stops crying. A few minutes later, she's with the sister, nothing wrong with the sister, but she's crying again. And he comes back and he says, I love you, and mentions her name. And it's in that moment she stops crying and opens her little eyes. I mean, can you imagine a few minutes old uh, and she looks and listens to the father's voice saying, I love you. And I believe that's a beautiful picture of what happens with the Lord for each one of us, that we can know that his voice says he loves you, he affirms you, he believes in you, he is helping you to fulfill the beautiful plan he has for you on this earth and that you and I will reach our fullest redemptive potential in and through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's at work in us, amen? And uh, we're grateful. We're great by the grace of God. I wanna speak about uh, wisdom. This is uh, a series that we're just taking a bit of time on because it's such a beautiful, rich um, portion of scripture, book of the Bible, uh, that talks in and around so many different themes, relevant themes that pertain to all of us and how that we can understand certain qualities to help us live a wise life. And we've said that wisdom from the book of Proverbs is all about uh, the ability to do the right thing and make the right decisions in the many or vast majority of situations where the commandments of God or the moral rules don't necessarily address, like what career should you pursue, who you should marry, what house you should buy, et cetera, et cetera, so many different things. And so we've said that also wisdom is being competent with regards to the realities of life, the reality of God, the reality of who you are, the reality of a broken world and God's redemptive purpose in this world and how he wants us to function in these interesting times. It's an adventure serving the Lord, an adventure. And when we look at the church of Jesus Christ over the last 2,000 years, gone through its various challenges, but the church is growing in momentum, he is building the church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And so here we're looking at various qualities in order to live a wise life. And we're gonna talk about a very important theme that I think every one of us need help in. It's the area around self-control. What happens when load shedding is happening a little too much and all of a sudden your temper wants to go beyond its normal threshold, you know, and start doing silly things. And uh, we are human and there's moments we, Bible says, be angry but do not sin. And uh, so we all face various situations in our life where sometimes we can get out of control and what the Bible talks about in terms of how we can live self-controlled lives. Because a man and woman without self-control is obviously not gonna live a wise life, a God-centered life. It's not gonna make the right choices in the heat of the battle, the pressure, the pain that sometimes we go through. And so we're not gonna make wise choices. What we're gonna do, if we're gonna be out of control and not exercise self-control by the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, we're gonna not only mess up our own lives, hurt ourselves, but also those around us. And I think sometimes our deepest regrets in life, unless we come to the Lord and experience His forgiveness, are some of the choices we made where we realize, you know what, I was out of control in that moment, and uh, look at that, but the God does redeem when we look to Him and He helps us. And so we're gonna look at three specific areas around the whole subject of self-control. The problem of self-control, the principle of self-control, and how we can practice self-control Uh, by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And um, I've talked, uh, titled this series, this message today, Broken Walls, Broken Walls. My prayer is that the Lord, wherever there's broken walls, would restore the walls in our lives. So let's look at the problem of self-control. Let's look at a pretty easy example. Uh, Firstly, we could understand Uh, I believe that the Word of God, it's about God's Word, brings comfort, it brings encouragement, it also challenges us, it exhorts us, encourages us in the faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. And that when we look to the Word of God, which is our final authority in our lives, we begin to see that how God has created so many things for our enjoyment, beautiful things for us to enjoy. And you think about fruit. Um, uh, Even looking at this morning, looking through the window, Uh, seeing the frost on the grass. Um, Here we're going through a different season this this time, and so it's an enjoyable, it's a a season to embrace and enjoy. Um, 
Yeah, but there, there's a balance. And so there's beautiful things that have been given to us and we need to enjoy them and things that bring joy and love. And then also we get to realize that even though things are beautiful and enjoyable, they can become extreme. They begin excessive. We can do excessive things or extreme things with some of these beautiful things that have been given to us to enjoy. And so let's look at what Proverbs 23 verse 19 to 21 says. This is an easy example when we're looking at self-control. Listen, my son, and be wise. And set your heart on the right path. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. For drunkards and gluttons become poor and drowsiness clothes them in rags. And see here, the scripture is talking about those who are excessive, who've eaten too much, drunk too much to a place where they're now drowsy. It's literally like they're vegging. They can't, they can't really function. They're just drowsy. And in that moment, they're not focusing on the most important things. They can't rise to do all the things that they're called to do. And this is not just talking about an individual moment, but this is speaking about people who are now almost addicted. There's a habitual behavior in terms of too much binge drinking, too much binge overeating. And as a result, they can't focus on the important things of life like serving God, serving others, maintaining relationships, as well as making money and all these different important things. And as a result of that neglect, what happens, their life begins to fall apart. Now, there's a very powerful scripture we're gonna focus in on the next few moments, and that is from Proverbs 25, 28, which broadens this idea. And it says this, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Like a city whose walls are broken through or broken down is a person who lacks self-control. And so the original language when it talks about this phrase, a man who lacks control, a person who lacks control is really referring to a person that cannot manage his own spirit. And so when we look at the scriptures here, the heart can refer to certain things, the spirit can refer to things. Normally in the heart, when the Bible's talking about the heart, it's not necessarily referring to our emotions, but rather talking about our core beliefs, our core convictions as to what we believe is most important in life, living out of those convictions and those truths. But the word spirit in terms of this concept uh, context of restraining a spirit, a man who res cannot restrain his spirit, that spirit is referring to your passions, your desires, your emotions. And so here it's really saying a man who can't control his desires, his emotions, his passions is out of control and therefore is a city without walls. Now, why is the word city without walls an important metaphor? It's a beautiful metaphor for us to understand because when you look in ancient times, as you go back thousands of years ago, cities had walls. And a city, for a city to not have walls, uh, you were vulnerable and defenseless against anything. You were, you were vulnerable um, and uh, you, uh, you, disaster could take place in your own town, in your own city, if you didn't have walls. Why? Because the city that had walls referred to um, a market system that you could now, when there was harvest, you could bring in the harvest and people could sell and enjoy the harvest, the food and the crops, etc. But if you, a city didn't have walls, well, there was no security. Raiders and armies could come in and just plunder uh, and take what didn't belong to them. Why? because there was no security around the people. So here, a wall represented security and that you could now have like a market economy. You could do business and live and sell and eat as, well as, as you brought the crops in. A city that had a wall also had a justice system, a justice system where you could sort out disputes if you didn't have walls, what would happen generally if there was a dispute or conflict, all of a sudden it would lead to bloody battles between tribes and clans and families because now that's the only way we're gonna sort out this dispute. But a city that had walls had a justice system and there was elders and council and so now you could bring your dispute and conflict to the city councillors and they would now administer justice in that and help make white rise choices. So what is the scripture really referring to when it's talking about a city without walls is a man who lacks self-control? 
Well, firstly, let's see what the Bible's not saying. There are things that are here for enjoyment. Is the Bible saying that it's wrong to enjoy a good steak? Is it wrong to enjoy a glass of wine? No, the Bible's not saying, depending on your particular sensitivities to certain things. But what it is saying, if that becomes, if overeating, overdrinking, where you see that it's not just referring to this, um, if that becomes the main way in which you deal with life, the desire for it has become disproportionate or disproportional. If anything, if any desire, if any passion for anything gets out of control, what it will do is it'll squeeze out the important things in your life and your life will fall apart. Just like a city was defenseless against the chaos and they were vulnerable to armies and invaders without a wall. So in the same way, a man or woman who's not gonna exercise self-control by the power of the Holy Spirit is really defenseless against the chaos that inevitably is gonna come into their lives. And so here the scripture saying a wise man, a wise woman has realized the importance of exercising self-control in all the different themes of our lives. Otherwise, you're defenseless against what could come against you. A good definition in and around self-control is this, it's the ability to recognize and choose the important thing over the urgent thing at any given moment. Because within yourself, your desires, your passions are properly ordered, are properly ordered. So the most important things are desired the most and the least important, the urgent things are desired less. And so remember, we're talking about a person who lacks self-control, he cannot manage his longings, his desires, they're not properly ordered, and therefore his whole life is out of control. It's not just that area. If we think about something like our own appetite for food, it's a God-given appetite. Um, but here, if we give in, the, uh, give in to the urge just to always eat the urgent things, just the things that undermine our health rather than eating the important things that maintain and nurture us, what happens, it's not just our appetite that's out of control, but our whole life can over time become, get out of control. Until the doctor has a meeting with us and says, listen, if you don't stop eating that or stop drinking that, that's gonna, you're gonna die. And so you, your life is out of control. And in that moment, we're gonna realize, wait a minute, I've gotta now exercise, this is, make wise decisions over the important things rather the important things over the urgent things. Another example could be maybe your mouth is out of control. There's a moment there where you always feel like I can just lash out and just ruin relationships which are more important to maintain than to just vent your emotions and cut and ruin and break down people and break down relationships. And so the moment your mouth is out of control, guess what happens? It opens the door to your whole life being out, out of control because now all of a sudden relationships are collapsing and being ruined. And so when you choose the urgent thing over the important thing, because the desires of our lives aren't properly ordered, your life is like a city without walls. It's defenseless against the chaos that can come in. And this is part of the problem of self-control. Now, there are many things that cause our lives to get out of control. There's obviously the classic addictions like gambling and uh, over drinking and overeating. Um, there's also rage, rage and anger. Sometimes our, our lives are out of control. It's our anger. Sometimes it's physical abuse and, and battering. Um, it also can be things like sexual addictions. Um, there's also eating too much, not eating enough. There are all those classic addictions that are, can be devastating our lives. And there's, there's a long list in terms of those classic addictions. But on the other hand, there are also addictions that don't seem as destructive, um, like your tongue is out of control. You just say what, say what it is, and sometimes we can cut and ruin people we love. Uh, there are people who are addicted to work and money. You can be addicted to work, not, not, we've spoken about loving work and enjoying work, there's the balance, but sometimes we can be addicted. It's like addicted to money. It, I'm just, the person's just driven to make more and more and more, and it's never ever enough. And as a result, your time and your morals get out of control, and, why, and you can't maintain relationships. 
Uh, this, the, our tension sometimes can be out of control. We don't have the fortitude or we can't stop a, a stick with hard things over a long period of time. Sometimes we over committing and over promising and never following through and letting everyone down and it's hurting our career, it's hurting our relationships. The, our own thoughts can sometimes be out of control. It's like we, we are, there's these anxious thoughts. We can't stop our anxious thoughts. We can't stop our fearful thoughts, our thoughts of self-doubt, and sometimes our own envious or jealous thoughts. Sometimes our own spirit is out of control. We make impulsive decisions, and we look back and think, well, what was I doing? I felt I couldn't, I, I, I don't even know why I did that. And so I think if we honest about our lives and we look in the mirror of God's word, maybe there's some areas where we think, wait, maybe I'm lacking a bit of self-control and the Lord's maybe wanting to say, I wanna help you in that. He wants us to live wise and fruitful and blessed lives. And so if you need to be a city, if you're a city without even a, br a little break in the wall, we're gonna see there's a vulnerability um, in that area. You can have this perfect wall, but if there's that one area, we're gonna say, Lord, give me grace and wisdom and how to deal with this. And so therein lies part of the problem of self-control. We defense this against some of the chaos that can inevitably come into our lives. So what's the principle of self-control? How do we get it? There's an important scripture that I believe we're gonna camp in on here that gives encouragement to us all, but it's still keeping, it's in keeping with this whole idea of cities with walls. Speaking of the security, listen to what Proverbs 18, verse 10 to 11 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it a wall too high to scale. So here, a city wall represented security as well as the tower in the city, the high tower in the city represented security. If there was an attack, what would happen, people 20, 30 k's radius of the city would run to the city to get behind the city walls for their protection and their security. If there was a breach on the wall, against the wall, then what would happen is people would run to the tower and that's where you would feel safe and secure. So here, we see what is the scripture saying to us here the, that everyone runs into something for their ultimate security. In those days, the city, the city with walls and the tower that was part of your ultimate security, your safety. And here the Bible's also saying the wealth, the wealthy think their wealth is an unscalable wall. Now it's nothing against having wealth, but it's that in their minds, people who have wealth sometimes think, well, that's my unscalable wall. That's my ultimate security. That's what I run into. That's what makes me feel safe and secure and significant. And so it means everybody, everybody on this earth has a wall, has a tower, something we run to. Every place, everybody has a place of ultimate security where we say, if I have that, my life will be okay then I will be safe, then I will be secure. And so the problem is that when you go into an imaginary high tower, thinking that's the only thing that will, that's an unscalable wall, that's where I'll feel safe and secure, um, there's something that you think will give you that ultimate security, but what happens if it really can't? What happens to that thing that you really believe is your ultimate security can't really give you the security? Now, it's in this moment we might think, okay, well, Chris, yes, what's the big deal? What's this got to do with self-control, addictions, etc.? Yes, the wealth, um, wealthy go into their wealth, other people go into their romantic relationships, everybody goes into something. But what has this got to do with self-control? We know this, that most self-control problems don't necessarily have a physical addiction, a brain physical chemical addiction to certain substances, but what we need to understand is the followers of God, and in order for us to live wise, fruitful, fulfilled lives, you need to realize that anything, anything besides God that you look to as your ultimate security will create addictive patterns in your life and mine. Anything besides God that you're looking to as your ultimate security will create addiction patterns in your life. It could be money, it could be your career, it could be a specific relationship. 
And so as you look to, whatever you look to as your ultimate security in life, rather than God, what it does, it can become, create addictive patterns in our life. And we could focus in, in and around addiction, how sometimes you're going through stress and pain, and so we look to something to relieve us of that stress. But over time, we need more and more of that thing, and now, what it does, it's not even dealing with the original pain is why we took it. Now, that substance and the abuse of that substance is creating its own set of problems. And it's been said at the heart of addiction is this thing called the tolerance effect. The tolerance effect. When you start with a substance at first, it gives you a high. And then that's why people will go back to it. And the tolerance effect really means this. The body gets used to, adapts to the substance. And so what happens is we need more and more of that substance to get that same level of high, that good feeling. But the problem is we never can really get it. And so what happens, and this is where the addiction starts, we feel that we need more and more of that thing, more and more of that substance to get less and less of that good feeling, and that's where it's a spiral. We spiral down, we get stuck, and that thing can drive you. Now, that's exactly what's going to happen if you and I put anything in the place of God in your life. If there's anything that is your wall, anything that's your tower, my tower, anything that's your unscalable wall, it's gonna drive us if it's not God. It's gonna drive us. You're gonna need more and more of it to feel secure and significant. And it'll never give you what it should give you. It can be money, it can be a career, it can be certain relationships, certain things, certain substances. And what happens for people who understand the power of addiction, what drives the addiction is not just a longing not just of the brain or the belly or the loins, as someone once said it, but it's really a longing of the heart for some fulfillment, for some wholeness. And really the heart for the the longing and the desire of the heart of every one of us is actually longing for God. That's really what we're longing for. And so idolatry, idols like addictions, what they really do is they lead us away from the one the only one that can truly satisfy you, heal you and me and fulfill us, the Lord, God. And so we're not just talking about substances, we're talking about anything, anything that you have made other than God is your ultimate security. So what are we meant to do when we understand this tension of the problem? What is really the principle of self-control according to what the scripture is saying? Proverbs 18, 10 again says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. The righteous man, woman, runs into it and is safe. The strong tower, it's not money, it's not career, nothing wrong with those things, it's not substances, but it's the name of the Lord. And here, the writer of Proverbs is saying, listen, the way you're gonna overcome your lack of self-control is by running into the name of the Lord. Now, what is the name of the Lord? The name of the Lord is our strong tower. And when we look at the name of the Lord, it can refer to so many different beautiful truths, but we're just gonna camp on two specific ones. The name of the Lord means telling yourself the truth, telling your mind the truth about God and converting your soul to love. It's telling yourself, telling your mind the truth about God, telling your mind the truth that converts your soul to love. I'll elaborate on that now. And so if we have self-control issues, lack of self-control, these are two specific areas that we can focus in on. The one is tell your mind the truth. Tell your mind the truth. This is part of the name of the Lord. Understand the name of the Lord speaks of his nature. The name is not just a label, but when you speak about a person's name, it was representing their nature, uh, their attributes. Uh, I enjoy my name. I love my name. It's Christopher. Uh, It means Christ bearer. Lisa would say you need to declare and prophesy your name more often so you can start to bear Christ more often and into your life. But it's a good declaration. Now, your name represents attributes. And so the name of the Lord, the name of God, speaks of who he is, his nature. Just like Abraham, Abraham, when his name changed to Abraham, the Lord was saying, you're gonna be a father of many nations. Simon has a change of character 
And now all of a sudden his name is changed to Peter, which means stone, that he would be a stone of stability. And that's exactly what he became. So the name of the Lord refers to who he really is. And so when the Bible is saying the righteous run into the name of the Lord, it's their tower, it's their ultimate security. What it's also saying to us, what we're gonna do is we're gonna forcefully tell ourselves who he is. Tell yourself who he is, that God, you're omniscient, that God, you're all present, that you're all loving, that Lord, you're all merciful, Lord, that you're holy, that you're, you're full of peace and you're full of joy and that God, you've got the power to help me in whatever I'm going through so that you can help me, uh, help me, I guess I'm a work in progress, but Lord, you can help me make wise choices where the temptation and the pressure is coming against you right now. Lord, you can give me grace. And Lord, I'm gonna remind myself who you are, that you're holy, righteous, loving, merciful God. And you wanna lead me through this. We know the famous story when Jesus is in the boat with his disciples and he's fast asleep and what happens? There's a huge storm. The disciples, they panic like most of us would. And now all of a sudden, the emotions are out of control and they wake up Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He calms the storm, but then he also speaks into the hearts of his disciples, his followers, and he says, where is your faith? Where is your faith? It's almost as if the Lord was saying to them, listen, you lost self-control because you forgot who I am, who is with you. All of a sudden, your emotions, you were thinking the storm is bigger than you and bigger than God. And I love that song that we sang earlier that our God is bigger, better, stronger, stronger than any storm, stronger than any giant that would come our way. And Jesus is saying, listen, you forgot who I am. In your faith, you're gonna not only believe in me, but you're gonna believe me and understand who I am. Run into the name of the Lord, his nature, his person. And Lord, right now, the reason I'm losing self-control, Lord, I'm forgetting who I'm serving and who I'm loving and who I'm worshiping. And Lord, I'm gonna tell myself the truth when I'm facing certain challenges, when I wanna do the wrong thing. And so it's telling yourself the truth about who God is, not what your feelings are telling you, what culture's baiting and telling us what people in the office are telling us to do, but rather it's about knowing who God is and telling yourself that. Now, in the short run, that helps us when you're going through those moments just to remind yourself who God is. Forcefully tell yourself the truth. The truth sets us free. But there's something that we're gonna need deeper to happen in the hearts, our hearts, that I believe is the secret to self-control. Remember guys, as I talk to you, please know, I, yes, I stand behind a podium, but I stand here in the grace of Jesus and I preach to you the word. And I, like you, are a work in progress, allowing the Lord to do a work in me as he's doing work in you. Tell yourself the truth about, tell your mind the truth about God that also converts your soul to love. This is where we're gonna convert our souls to love. This is where the, the word name, the phrase, the name of the Lord, not only refers to his nature, but also that God is not some impersonal force, but he's rather a person, a person with a heart. We are made in his image, that he loves us, that he wants to communicate to us, that he wants a personal love relationship with you and me. He loves us. And so ultimately, self-control comes from what you love the most. Self-control comes from what you love the most. This is important, this is how self-control works. Beautiful story, it's about a man called Jacob, and he has his own journey of redemption, and yeah, God is setting him up for some great things in his life, and he falls in love with this woman called Rachel. And the Bible says Rachel was beautiful. And so here, yeah, he's fallen in love with her and he talks to Laban, Uncle Laban, and he says, I wanna marry Rachel. And Laban says this, he says, you're gonna have to work for me for seven years if you want Rachel. And so Jacob makes the decision to do whatever it takes to have his Rachel. And this is what Genesis 29, 20, and this is part of the secret of self-control. Never seen it this way before I researched this. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her, because of his love for her. You would think after the second year working for Laban, he must have thought to himself, well, this is getting long and laborious and tedious. I, I, I'm getting tempted just to do the wrong thing and do I have to really pull, pull myself together here? How can I really exercise self-control? But you know what? Here the Bible is saying, 
it didn't, it didn't even seem like self-control to him. Why? Because he loved Rachel. He was so passionately in love with, with Rachel that he was prepared to exercise the self-control. It was his love, it's what he loved most. His self-control was coming from what he loved most. He loved his Rachel. And as a result of being in love with his Rachel, the seven years went through so quickly. He was able to keep his emotions, his desires intact. Why? Because of his love and his passion for her. So, when we're converting our soul to love, which is part of the secret to, with self-control, as you convert your soul to loving God and understanding how He loves us, that gives us a dimension, a perspective in growing in self-control. How do we practice this? How do we practice? We understand the principle, telling yourself the mind, telling yourself the mind, the mind, the truth, and also converting the soul to love, running into the name of the Lord, which is my strong tower, that's my ultimate security. What do I, who am I gonna love? It's a beautiful scripture in Titus 2. And this is what it says. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The grace of God has appeared to all men. Speaking of Jesus, His kindness and mercy, the person of Jesus. Listen to what the grace of God does for us. It teaches us to say no. Teaches us, the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. To hear the grace of God, the mercy of God is helping me live a self-controlled life. What is this saying? Grace speaking of His mercy and His love, also speaking of Jesus. Now that's not how we've necessarily taught self-control. If you parents, sometimes you, and I know we haven't always used grace and mercy, We've used threats. You're not going to the party unless you clean up your room and you're going to stay in your room. Otherwise, you're not going tonight. Yes, yes, dad. Yes, mom. Yes, I'll do whatever you want. Over time, that doesn't lead us to really living self-controlled lives, threats and fear and all those things. That's not, what, that's not how Jacob got control. He got it because of his love, because of grace. Important principle for us here from Titus, it's saying, for the grace of God appeared. The grace of God appeared. The grace of God became visible. How did the grace of God become visible? Person of Jesus. You wanna see what God's like? You wanna see what mercy's like? You wanna see what grace is like? Look at Jesus. The grace of God appeared. People had a firsthand revelation of seeing grace that was appearing before them. Jesus was born. He lives a sinless, self-controlled, loving life, serving people. He dies for our sin out of mercy and grace for us, and He's raised from death. And the Bible talks about how we were saved, saved not because of righteous things that we did, but because of God's grace and mercy, because of His love and mercy. That's why we were saved. And so when we say, hey, we can run into the name of the Lord, we can run into Jesus, that we can have a, an experience of His presence internally, His power internally in us and upon us. People run to the city and the tower to get security. It's how it happened in old days. It hasn't changed in these days, it's just different. We have different walls, different towers in our minds, but yet Jesus needs to be that tower. But interestingly, when Jesus becomes Emmanuel, God in the flesh, comes to this earth because He loves us, guess what happens? He runs into the city and what happens? He's crucified for our sin. The people throw him out of the city. They reject him. They crucify him. They treat him as a criminal. He's executed on a hill. He's thrown out. He's rejected from the city. When he comes into the city, he's rejected from the city. He loses the love and the Father as he's becoming sin for us. This is the eternal justice that's happening. The Trinity are all involved in the redemption of mankind. But here, Jesus becomes so vulnerable, he's hoisted onto a cross and executed for us, killed for us. Why is he doing this? He's paying a price so that we, as the people of God, as people can run into the Father's arms and understand He's our true tower and that we can be fully safe and significant in our relationship with Him. 
Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, how is, he, how is He able to endure such suffering, such rejection, such pain? What gave Him that endurance? How did He get the self-control? I mean, you think about it, you realize the greatest act of self, self-control in history was Jesus Christ knowing exactly what was coming. He knew the rejection, he knew the abandonment, he knew the pain, literally knew the pain days before that he was gonna endure for every one of us. How does he have that self-control? Even the garden of Gethsemane, sweat like drops of blood. He knows exactly what awaits him as he's gonna take the sin of the world, every sin committed by every human being, past, present, and future. But what does he do? He stays with it. He's beaten, he's crucified, but he stays with it. What enabled Jesus to exercise self-control in the face of pressure and persecution and temptation? He could have just said, I don't wanna do this, it's too painful. But he's wise and he keeps the path. Hebrews 12, two, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. Think about Jesus, Son of God, part of the Trinity, has everything, everything before He comes to earth. All glory, everything. What in the world do you give a man who has everything? What motivated, what reward would motivate Jesus to endure the suffering, rejection, abandonment, all those different things? The only thing Jesus Christ did not have before the cross that He had after the cross is us, you, me. You know what that says? The reason why Jesus Christ had so much self-control is because you are His Rachel. Passionately loves you and me, amen? And I believe the degree to which you and I know that we tell the truth Tell our minds the truth that converts our soul to love, that he, that you and I was Rachel and that we can become his Rachel. It's part of the secret of self-control. It's why I endured the cross, because he loves you, he loves me. Now what happens when that begins to sink in your heart that God is so passionate about me, loves me so much, he wanted to reconcile me, He's passionately in love with me and that I need to make him my Rachel and pursue him and love him and put him first. When that begins to sink in, the addictions, the idolatries, the things that try and lead us away from the true longing of a heart, which is Jesus, over time, those things don't have the pull as they, yes, we'll always have the flesh, but that's why we're gonna keep on running into the name of the Lord and being secure and nurture that love relationship with him. Titus 2, let's look at it again. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. This grace, Jesus, His mercy, His kindness, His presence, teaches us, it's telling our minds the truth. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And this is, the power of the gospel, the Bible says, let's not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that every one of us can have a right relationship with God and that the gospel says you are so deeply loved and valued by God that loves you and has done everything to redeem us and save us and that we can make him our Rachel and love him. And it's out of doing that, that's what gives us the power that love for him, that love for us to live self-controlled lives. And then verse 13 says, while we wait, while we wait for the blessed hope, we can, we as the people of God never have to lose hope. There is a blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is part of the secret of self-control. God is our strong tower. We can run to him, make him your ultimate security, your significance, 
your purpose. Just let's all be about Him, loving Him. Lord, I don't wanna do this and that. Lord, yes, I'm gonna miss it here and there. Your forgiveness, your mercy, but Lord, I wanna keep you first. And the more in love I am with you, Lord, that's how you keep me away from making unwise choices. We, we're constrained by His love. We are moved by His love. My prayer is, oh Lord, Holy Spirit, can we just bow our heads? Holy Spirit, please help us in this. Please, I pray that we would really center our affection and our devotion and love on you to open our eyes, our spiritual eyes, our psychological eyes, our soul eyes, our spirit eyes, just to understand how glorious and loving you really are, that we'd not allow the voices of the world and the enemy to undermine who you really are, that you exist and that you wanna reward those who diligently seek you. And Lord, you've done so much already just through the power of the gospel, through your death, your burial and your resurrection. And you did it for each one of us. Lord, let our hearts enlarge, enlarge our hearts to be filled with love and worship of you. And to understand, Lord, you are prized. Lord, you are reward. Lord, you are the center of it all. Lord, that we run into you, that we can run into the Father's arms and know, Lord, that we're secure and safe in you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Some of you actually just gotta get that picture in your mind. We've been running to the wrong towers, but run to the true tower. That's what'll set us free and affirm us and assure us that we are children of God. Can we pray a stand rather? And before we go, this is a beautiful song it's all about running into the Father's arms. And let us, as we declare this song, let this be a desire of each one of our hearts.
is running to love the Lord is a strong tower the righteous run into it and are safe amen can we just bow our heads just for a few moments maybe there's someone here this morning online you need Jesus you've never ever made a personal decision to receive Jesus as your Savior and your Lord the best decision you can ever ever make and it's quite simple. All you're gonna do is open the door of your heart and say, Jesus, please save me from my sin. Every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and we can't save ourselves by our own works. Jesus comes in as the Savior. So if that's you this morning, please just pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I need you. Thank you for loving me so much. You are prepared to die for me, for my sins, so that I can receive forgiveness, a new heart, a new life. I open the door of my heart, Jesus, and I invite you in to be my savior. Save me, Jesus. Jesus, be my Lord, my leader, my God, and take control of my life and make me into the person you've created me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you know the Bible says when one person, a sinner, turns to Jesus, there is a rejoicing in heaven, amen. And can we just rejoice? Somebody came to know Jesus today, the pearl of great price. New life, love you. We have prayer teams that are available to pray for you. Anybody that you just need prayer, you stay in the gap with someone, we believe in the power of prayer. You just need a fresh and filling of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the power of beautiful prayer. We've got freshly brewed coffee and then rooibos for our very healthy people. But uh, coffee, we'd love to connect with you in the foyer. If you prayed the prayer of salvation, there's a table there, free Bibles and resources to help you in your journey with Jesus. Have a glorious week, glorious day. Uh, see you next Sunday. Bless you.